All right, freshly updated slides. I love that when people are hacking away at it until the very last minute. Thank you so much for caring very much about this. It's really nice to have you again at Division Weekend. Um, it was really, really fun to have you there last time. And I am dying to hear what you have to tell us. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks, Alison. OK, so my name, my name is Amit Deshwar. And until uh, yesterday, I worked at Deep Genomics, leading the platform team that builds the machine learning models that underlie uh, what the company is doing. <clears throat> and even though I left, we luckily just put out this paper. Uh, and I'm excited to talk to you about both what we did and the, the promise of foundational models for biology, and particularly foundational models for RNA biology that learn how RNA works from the wealth of sequencing data that we have. Uh, and obvious in this, this was a very large collaborative effort uh, across, uh, across the company. So, you know, pretty much every single day on Twitter, I see a new foundational model for biology, um, looking at many different problems. And I thought I'd start by mentioning what is a foundational model? Okay, I'm being told, told where to stand. Um, and this is from Wikipedia. It's extremely vague, but I think gets at what they are, which are machine learning models trained on vast amounts of data, many, many parameters. And I think particularly what's interesting is that you can train one model and use it for many different things. And that's why people are so excited about foundational models, whether it's language or vision or robotics or biology, is that you can train single enormous models that capture everything we know about how these systems work, and then you can use them for many, many different things. So that's kind of the properties when you're building the model, but we're excited about them because one, they provide qualitatively different level or qualitatively better predictive accuracy that the transformer language models are not just a little bit better than the previous models, but really an enormous step up in our ability to understand, uh, understand, understand text or vision. Uh, second is that they can solve new problems without being trained to specifically do them. So this zero-shot learning capability is what makes them so broadly, broadly useful. And then finally, these, this combination of qualitatively improved performance, vast areas of applicability, means that we can do new things that before were not possible because the models weren't good enough or there wasn't enough data for particular, uh, particular use cases. Now we can do them. So what does our model called big RNA, what does it do? It is a model that takes as input DNA sequence and then tries to predict the, the RNA-seq read stacks that you would get if you do a RNA-seq experiment on a specific tissue type with that specific, specific genotype. And so we uh, train it on you know, some large amount of data. There's a billion parameters. And we add in, so it's not only predicting expression, but we also add in basically every single bit of NGS data that we can link to specific genotypes, RBP binding, microRNA binding, uh, ribosomal profiling, anything that we can map from an input DNA sequence to an output um, RNA, RNA-ish uh, output track, we train this massively multi-headed model on all of that. Do I have the number here? Yeah, so something like 3,000 uh, different, different output heads. And this is, this, is, this is different from the LLMs. The LLMs are typically trained to predict like the next word in a text or a missing word in a semi-supervised or unsupervised way. This is supervised, but in a massively multi-head way. Um, so in the paper, we talk about 12 different use cases. I'm not going to 
go through all of them. But let's look at what we get after we train this enormous model. Uh, on the top, I'm showing you an example of a gene where we have the actual RNA-seq data in GTAX uh, in orange, and then you have the output of the big RNA model in, uh, in teal. And so what you can see is that we're not just predicting some overall expression value for the gene, but we're actually predicting the specific transcript that's produced by that gene. So we're capturing the introns, the exons, and the relative expression level of that gene. And so we're not at perfect accuracy yet, but you can imagine that rather than needing to do an RNA-seq experiment for a, given, a given, given genotype, you can just take your genotype, run it through the model, and skip all the process of actually doing the RNA-seq. This, of course, is just an example. Uh, over there, I'm showing you what does the gene level expression count correlation look like for the hypothalamus. Uh, and you can see it's pretty, pretty good correlation. Again, not perfect, but pretty good. And we're not only able to predict the expression profile for one tissue type. This is showing the distribution of correlations across all the GTEx tissues. You can see most are in like the 0.7 range with a few, a few lower. Uh, and this kind of points, okay, where, where do we want to generate more data to improve the model? The ones that are highest tend to be brain, and uh, GTEx is heavily overrepresented in uh, brain samples. Uh, and so we're not, okay, so we can capture tissue-specific expression. We can also capture tissue-specific splicing. Uh, what I'm showing here is, again, the uh, predicted versus uh, GTEx data, GTEx on the bottom, predicted on the top, but the RNA-seq and the predictions for two different tissue types, the brain and liver. And the main thing I want to highlight is this differential splicing of this exon in the middle that the model is predicting that the exon is included a lot higher in the brain. And when you look at the RNA-seq, that's again exactly, exactly what you get. You know, predicting RNA-seq is interesting, but we want to see what else you can do with this capability. And so this is looking at, can the model predict other interesting aspects of RNA biology? In particular, uh, RBP binding sites and microRNA binding sites. These are important for understanding how genes are regulated. And what we're, we're comparing the performance from the state-of-the-art existing deep learning models that are only trained for that particular task with the performance that we get from our uh, multitask approach. And you can see that in both RBP binding and microRNA binding, we're not just doing a little bit better, but really big steps up in our ability to predict where these things bind. One minute? Okay, I gotta go really fast. Uh, why? <laughs> Why are the models suddenly getting so much better? And, and the key thing here is that people imagine when they build models that uh, biology is independent, that RBP binding is independent from splicing or independent from microRNA binding, and they're not. All these things are just different views of the same process, and so combining as much as we can together leads to much better uh, performance. Okay, some zero task learning. You can predict the effects of genetic variants. Very useful for diagnostics and target identification in complex diseases. Uh, you can predict the specific way that these variants have their effect, not just their increase or decrease in expression, but that they are, for example, causing intron retention, uh, changing polyadenylation sites, causing specific RBPs to bind more or less. And then finally, for zero task uses, you can predict how therapeutics uh, impact how RNA is regulated, changing splicing patterns, and changing uh, expression of the genes. So with that, I will wrap up. Oh, oh, guys, last thing. I think this is the future. I think that foundational models of machine learning are how we're going to understand biology, understand the drivers of disease, and design new therapeutics to stop them. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.